T-Bone is on the other side. T-Bone is on the other side. T-Bone Brackets Podcast on the other side. T-Bone Brackets Podcast on the other side. T-Bone, he said to Tom, originates, opinionates. T-Bone, musicality, originality. Every day of the week, Brackets Podcast on the other side. T-Bone Brackets. The talk space where musicians matter. Welcome to T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the Other Side, Episode 5. Today's guest, the legend, Steve Cropper. Now you may be asking yourself, who is Steve Cropper? You know that guitar intro on Soul Man by Sam and Dave and later by the Blues Brothers? That's Steve Cropper. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and the Musicians Hall of Fame. It doesn't get much bigger than that. Musicians know him, and some of you may also know the name, but everybody has heard his music. Steve has co-written, played guitar on, or produced some of the most iconic songs in music history. Today, we'll talk about Cropper and his connection with the famous Stax Records in Memphis, Booker T and the MGs, co-writing Sitting on the Dock of the Bay with Otis Redding, the great artists of the 60s, Wilson Pickett, Eddie Floyd, Sam Dave, Isaac Hayes, the blues legend Albert King, producing records on Jeff Beck, John Prine, and others, playing on records by Rod Stewart, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, Levon Helm, and not only was he in the Blues Brothers Band, but he was also in both movies and so much more. We'll have a great time today. Without further ado, here's Steve Cropper. Welcome to T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the other side. Our guest today is music legend, Steve Cropper. How you doing, Steve? Hanging in there, man. Having a great time. Now, Fired Up comes out on April 23rd. and. Okay. You're calling this your first proper solo album since 1969. Now, this... Well, I did. I, I said that the other day in an interview, and the guy that was interviewing me said, well, what about those two records you did on MCA? And I went, I completely forgot about those. <laughs> <laughs> and so I referred to them, and that was when I was learning how to sing or trying to. Right. But the guy that was behind that, his name was Jeff Franklin. He thought I was a singer, I guess, and so it was good to have somebody, you know, with the wind on your back. But uh, and it was he. It was during the uh, Blues Brothers tour that he came to me and said, "I want you to make a record. I've got you already a deal for MCA." And so I wound up the first one. I thought was the best album called uh, "Playing My Thing," and I thought that song was pretty good. I wrote it for the album. Right. I just started playing my thing, and it didn't matter whether I could sing or not. <laughs> And then the second, they wanted another album. And that was Night After Night. Right. And uh, so uh, when uh, on this album, on Fired Up, I, like I said, I forgot about those. I, I couldn't sing it. I still can't sing. You know, I'm not a <laughs> singer. Uh, but on Fired Up, those were old tracks written for a Felix Cavalier Steve Cropper project. Right. And Felix said he wasn't going to finish any of them. And, uh, you know, he played on a couple of them on the album. And we asked his permission, could we just use those tracks where you plan on? He said, absolutely. But he wasn't going to finish the lyrics and he wasn't going to sing them if he did. Right. So I just thought there were tracks that didn't ever happen. And John Tibbon and I, the co-producer, he and I used to write every Tuesday, I think it was. And I'd go over to his house and we'd write and he'd throw up a loop or something. Sometimes there were real drummers there. Most of the time it was just loops. Mm -hmm. And I would just do a set of change, changes on the loops and the way I heard it. So that's still there. I mean, the rhythm guitar, so I'm playing both guitars on the album. And it's not a studio album. <laughs> it was done in John's studio, but it's not a studio right. album. It was all direct, and the guitar was direct, except for the uh, the solo fills and embellishment or whatever that I put on later. And I did it after I heard the vocals for the first time. Not first time, but 
after I listened to the vocals a little bit to get that inspiration. And that was not direct. That's through my amp with a chord into the, but I'm in the control room listening to it back just like the engineer does. And uh, there's a way of doing that nowadays without getting a lot of feedback. In the old days, you couldn't do that without getting feedback. Yeah. I could at the stacks and I did that on Dock of the Bay. And the reason is we had such a large control room. Now we had confined everything into uh, a, a smaller area, but but the, the room itself was still wide open, and uh, it was basically the whole stage of of a theater. <laughs> <laughs> so I set the amp where I could hear it, but far enough away to where I didn't get any feedback. And uh, to bring everybody up to to par on that one, the last time that I actually saw Otis, he popped his head in the door and said, "I'll see you Monday." Right. And this was on Friday afternoon, and I was just setting up my amp and all, and and the guitar and all to do those overdubs. So he never heard the guitar overdubs mm. or the sea seagulls or the waves or the ocean waves. He never heard oh. any of that. So uh, on the new one, that's that's where those tracks come from. So when John Tibbin called me about them, he said, "You know, I still got all these old tracks that are pretty good. Let's finish them up and put out an album." I said, "John, I'm you know I don't want to put out." He said, "I know that." But he said, I said, well, we're going to need a singer. He said, I got one. I said, well, you better play, send me something he sang on. <laughs> I went, wow, that guy's incredible. And that's Roger C. Real. And he is good. Yeah, well, yeah. I've already had somebody call me from LA or e email me. They didn't text me, they emailed me and said, that's you singing. And I'm going, no, that's Roger C. Real. The other thing that you need to know about the album itself is that all of those vocals that Roger did, he did with an iPhone. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now later we, you know, it was, it was all real good, recorded very well. And uh, even our engineer, Eddie Gore said, I can't believe he did all that with an iPhone. <laughs> now we dubbed it all down to Pro Tools and mixed it and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, uh, Tibbin had access and all that and, and those vocals turned out great. And and his, his whole attitude, the way he approached every song and the lyric, I mean, it's like he's living the lyrics, it's great. And it was very easy to play behind somebody doing that, you know? Right. That's now, where the inspiration came from. Well, you know, this album's getting a ton of press and a lot of attention. I mean, are, <laughs> I know that we're really excited. Are, are you excited about the release this as we are? Or? Well, uh, it just depends because of the age thing. I know that it's probably going to do pretty good and they'll want another one. They may not get another one. <laughs> I may not be around right. to do another one. I don't know. I was already having a little trouble musically with my hands and um, not on this record, but, but when I embellish something I hadn't played on before, it's, it's, it's easy enough in your head to play on something you wrote, but it's not as easy to play on something when you're, you want to embellish or play a little different on somebody's song that, that you didn't write. And I was telling my wife, she, she got up one night and sang a couple of songs that, that I had never played on before. And I said, when I, we got through, I said, you know, it may have been okay, but I, I'm telling my hands to do something. They just wouldn't go there and do it anymore. It's different. So yeah. to play something that you've done all your life, like in the midnight hour, knock on wood, those songs, dog of the bay, I can play that in my sleep. Right. Doesn't matter. But new stuff you like to create. And my hands just won't do what they used to do. And they're getting old. They're, they're really feeling their age. I'm not yet. And I've always said as a joke, I said, you know, when I die, I'm going to die. Young. <laughs> <laughs> and that's attitude. That may not make me live any longer, but I sure will have a good time doing it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm no. not going to fret about it, getting old and all that stuff. It doesn't, doesn't matter. And I told a guy the other day, he said, you know, it's been 10 years since we've been together. It's been that long. I said, well, uh, I don't feel 10 years older, but I know that I look it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to ask you much about gear because I know you've talked so much about, you know, choosing Telecaster and all that stuff. But and but you did say that you played some on i mean you know had the amp and stuff some on this record and so what you what did you use for that well uh i've got a, a studio amp here that's going to be out for repairs for shortly uh a victoria handmade out of chicago oh, yeah. it's a handmade twin basically 
and there was a time when I had Bonnie Ray playing it and Robert Cray was playing it and Buddy Guy was playing it and then they've all got moved on to something else now. And that's the amp that I use in the studio all the time to overdub on. It's the same sound, same guitar. And we use the same long chord, bring it into the control room and that's what I play. And if we want more trouble, we'll just turn the treble up. If we want more bass, turn the bass up. It's that stuff. It's much like what I grew up on uh, playing uh, a lot of those Stax albums was an old Fender Harbor. Right. With just a tone control and a volume control. And that's it. <laughs> so. Now, speaking of that, I, I'm going to step back in time a bit and, and uh, touch on Green Onions, because as a guitarist, that is one of my favorite songs of all time. And if you could just tell us a little bit about how that came together, because I know that wasn't planned out. No, it was an accident, like a lot of them were. But uh, that particular one, uh, we were there on a Sunday. Booker says to do demos. I said, Booker, we never cut demos. <laughs> so as far as we knew, the songer hadn't, the singer had not shown up yet. The song, right. the singer had not shown up yet. What I found out later was he actually did show up, but he came to the record shop. He didn't come back in the studio. Oh, okay. And he told us, Stell Axton, AX, <laughs> T A X Stewart, and Axton, right. brother, sister. He came in, he said, You know, I can't sing. I can't go back and sing because he was singing all night. It was a Saturday night. He sang the night before all night long and obviously partied and he woke up, and didn't have a voice. So right. We didn't know that. So all we knew was the singer hadn't showed yet. So we just started jamming on some blues in the key of F. And uh, I, I refer to this same kind of thing. We'd, somebody would call, a, just play the blues and, and they'd call a key and you'd fill the time out. But when yeah. you were doing three or four shows a night, you know, 45 on, 15 off in those days. And uh, it was just a filler thing. So we get through and we're laughing about it and all that sort of stuff. And, and Jim Stewart got on, he was engineering that day. And he said, Hey guys, come up here and listen to this. It's pretty good. You're going, Why did you recorded that? <laughs> he said, yeah. I was ready to record the singer. And uh, he just reached over and pushed the button and we started playing. Wow. So he said that day, he said, we all listened to it. And we said, man, it's pretty good. <laughs> he said, if we decided, if we decided to put something like this out, do you have anything you could cut for the B side? In those days, that was in the days of A and B side. Right, right exactly. <clears throat> and we just looked at each other dumbfounded. And I did remember, and I'm not saying I came up with anything, but it was, it was, I did say, Booker, you played me something about two weeks ago that you thought might be a good riff for, for a vocal song. Do you remember that song? And he said, well, I don't know. Come down to the organ and I'll play a few things and see if it's one of them. And he played the riff for Green Onions. I said, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so... I think we put out the third take, so we ran it down, and and I was doing that thing that I do in uh, when I play a solo in the middle of the record, the third verse. I was doing the tune, tune. Right. So Jim Stewart said, "Hey, Steve, that thing you're doing in the middle, why don't you put that on the intro for an intro of the song, and then when it comes to that eight bars, just play a regular solo." Yeah, I like I'm a solo guitar player, <laughs> so. I did, and it all worked out. So when it comes time for my solo, you can hear that's on the record. And I, I hear it every time I hear it even more now. Is I hit him so hard, I just jammed the needle probably. And you can just, he turned the volume back down on the on the <laughs> console. And when he did, he turned it too far. And he, you can hear him just barely edging it back up. Maybe that's what made <laughs> it hit. I don't know. <laughs> but I really did hit him hard on that first lick. So. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Otis Redding? I minimize Otis Redding, who was somebody who was bigger than life, basically. Yeah. And he still is. He, You know, after his passing, I think he got bigger. And um, a lot of people don't know how young he was. Right. When he passed away, he was only 26. That's pretty pretty young, about today's standards, anyway. So it is what it is. And uh, he just seemed like older. He was, uh, I say, streetwise. He was just a very wise guy. And he was a big guy, so he looked a little older than he actually was most of the time, was able to do that. And uh, he was just a super, super guy, great friend and a good buddy. And uh, to regress a little bit, Belushi also was. He never refused to fan an autograph, and Otis didn't either. And the thing about Otis, I think Alan Walden put it best. He said he had a million-dollar smile. You could be 100 yards away, and if you was walking up to him, he'd be your new best friend the minute you got up there. 
or before you started walking, he was your new best friend. And I just smiled as he just encouraged you to come on, come on, you know, who knows who you are. And that's the way he was. He never knew. I don't think he knew how big he was, how great he was. He, he just didn't know that. So <laughs> I'm not going to tell him if you won't tell him. <laughs> yeah. What, you know, what direction do you think he would have gone in had he, had he been here? You know, I don't know. And uh, that question gets asked, what would he be doing today? I have no idea. Probably still performing Doc of the Bay. Right. But what would have gone that way? I don't know. It was the first song that we actually did was in that kind of medium tempo. And and we kind of knew before it was released, that was our new crossover record. And we needed to cross him over. We needed to get him a little bit more pop radio play. Right. And he was being played like crazy on the ethnic stations, on the R&B stations. But he was not being played on the pop stations. Now, they didn't have pop and ethnic stations uh, in Europe, so he got played a lot in Europe. He was much bigger over there than he was oh, over yeah. here. And we needed to break him over here, and that Doc of the Bay did it. Whether he'd have gone that way or not, I have no idea. I don't know. As a producer, I would have probably steered him in that direction, but I'm not sure he would have said yes. We'd have to see. It depends on the material, I guess. So I don't think there was anything after Doc of the Bay that anybody sent me that uh, – that maybe didn't know that he was uh, had passed away, that I actually lost or turned down or, you know, I, I don't remember any songs. So right. there was some. That was a biggie. <laughs> it's been a big one worldwide forever and still is today. So there you go. Supporting T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the Other Side podcast gives you interesting inside views from the talk space where musicians matter. Go to tbpcpodcast.com and click the donate button. All contributions are much appreciated. Now, what, when I've seen you live, you always, before you play this next, this song, you always tell the knock on wood. You always tell a story about you and Eddie Floyd in the hotel and the whole bit. And for those people that aren't lucky enough to have seen you live, can you share <laughs> that with us? Well, I do, and I and I'll say, well, I open with a song, and I'm I'm sure you guys know the song if you don't know the intro. And I said, Eddie and I knew that we had written a good song, but we couldn't come up with an intro. And and I don't know what made me think of this. I said, Eddie, what do you think in the midnight hour would sound like backwards? And it's just follow the dots. Right, so right. I followed the dots down. For, for, <laughs> he'd been in the midnight hour, and I followed him up for knock on wood. He said, I don't know. Play it. And I played it. He said, there's our intro. <laughs> and it would land you, right? And you, you get to the B, dip, dip, it's dun, dun, dun. So it's E, G, A, B, D, B. And if you could just fall right back on the A. And the thing about knock on wood that makes it different, it's a four change. It's the A change. And yeah. the key is still in the key of E. I don't want to lose. It starts on a bridge, basically. That's what we used to go to when we ride a bridge, We're doing a tonic. And, and if you when the key of E, you go to A for the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> and it always started on the A change. It just did. It wasn't in the key of E. I mean, A, it was in the key of E. So. That's now, what we did. now, that that was a a, a time when, when you were he was trying to come up or you guys were trying to come up with something that was uh, superstition related. Well, that's why I started. I said, Eddie, when I went down to the rain at night, he said, Steve, I got a great idea for a song. I said, what's that? And he said, I want to write a song about superstitions. And we weren't thinking about Stevie Wonder superstition, but it's a superstition. So rabbit's feet, breaking glasses, walking under ladders, opening an umbrella in a dry room and all things <laughs> like that, you know. Right. Throwing salt over your shoulder. And at the end of all, after we'd exhausted about everything that was too exhausted, we could remember about superstitions. I said, Eddie, what do people do for good luck? And he says, they go on wood. I said, there's our song right there <laughs> for good luck. He said, well, they knock on wood for good luck. And I go, yeah, I, I'm happy I got this girl it's good luck and yeah. I, I don't want to lose this woman that I've got and that's where that song started wow it's amazing I don't want to lose this good thing that I got if I do I'd surely lose a lot your love is better than any love I know it's like thunder like lightning the way she loves me is frightening I think I better 
on wood. <laughs> <laughs> now it, it was uh, rain, it's storming that night, and that's where he came up with that. Uh, well, I, and, he, and he reminded me we were doing an interview, and he said, "You know, at night it it really was like thunder, like lightning. It really was a storm coming in over the bluff, and we were downtown anyway, so it would come right to the bluff within a mile of, or less than a mile wow. of where we were, and then jump overhead." <laughs> But we were so proud of that song. We knew we had something that would be radio worthy, or, you know, yeah. worthy of a single. We just knew it. So I called uh, Al Jackson. I mean, uh, Wayne Jackson, not Al Jackson. Oh, yeah. Wayne Jackson. On his gig, he was playing over in West Memphis. And uh, I, and at the time, he was on stage, and I got a waitress. I said, when Wayne gets off stage, tell him we, to call me. And he called me when it, when it took a break. And I said, when you get through with your gig, get over here to the Lorraine Motel. All he had to do was cross over the bridge. It was, <laughs> he was five minutes away. <laughs> and he did. And we worked on the song. I said, I want to I want to have the horns ready tomorrow when we cut the song. And we cut it. And lo and behold, for some reason, Jim didn't, didn't think it was a, a single. And it hmm. stayed in the can, what we call the can, on the shelf for nine months before we got wow. it out. So we had, so when Al Bell, he came in at that time, I had been, been there. I went up to, to Washington, D.C. and asked him to come back. When he left, I said, man, I've lost my best friend. And Jim said, well, go up there and get him back. I said, I don't know if we can afford him. He said, make him a deal. And so he came back as vice president. He put pressure on, uh, because I Eddie had, and I had been on him about it. He put pressure on Estelle, and Estelle put pressure on Jim, and she said, Jim, we got to put this record out. He said, okay, we'll put it out, but you're going to spend your own money. <laughs> One of the biggest songs we ever had, that in, in the Midnight Hour and Dock of the Bay, I guess. It's, you know. But, uh, you know, when you ask about Green Onions, uh, you know, those are still instrumentals. So it was a long time before I was able to play anything or get anything recorded that I wrote lyrics to. Oh, yeah. And I've been writing lyrics since probably I was about 14 or 15 anyway. I never wrote poetry as such, but I wrote rhyming lyrics. And uh, so I figured, uh, you know, his favorite artist was Carla Thomas. And I don't blame him for that. That was oh, great. Yeah. And she had come off a number one record, G Wiz. And uh, so I went to her one day and I said, Carla, I've written a song I think you ought to listen to. <laughs> so we went down to the piano and she said, on the piano stool beside me and I've started playing the, uh, No Time to Lose. And she loved it. And she said, I want to cut that. So she, she said, can I contribute and write some of the lyrics? I said, yeah. So she did. And uh, she talked to Jim and she said, I want to cut this song. So money wise, uh, acceptance wise, I guess you'd say not money wise, but it, it made uh, as much noise, not as gee whiz, but <clears throat> that was the first hit she had. Oh yeah. Play wise, airplay wise and chart wise since G whiz. <clears throat> And then all of a sudden they wanted to hear everything that I'd ever written. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wasn't all that great a writer. And I hate, I hate it when I write something. I, I write all the time, but I'm more of a title guy than I'm a writer. So I love uh, co-writing. Can you tell us anything about uh, Isaac Hayes? Well, it depends on what you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you this, at Stax, he was a replacement for Booker when Booker went off to college. Right. He wasn't the artist that everybody knows him for. He was a replacement piano player. So I still have trouble deciphering who played what on what, you know, who played organ, who played piano, right. when we, both of them. When Booker would come home on leave or whatever, he would come home for, you know, spring break or whatever he'd come home for. He was automatically would be on the session. So then we would have organ and p piano. Well, they could both equally play one you know, the other. It didn't matter. <clears throat> so, uh, and that was before the days of computers a lot. So, you know, right. I, and I can't dis distinguish the one from the other because we trained um, Isaac Moore. I mean, just by, by doing, we didn't train him. We didn't tell him anything to do. Just by him being there, he fit right into the Stax persona and the Stax band and the Stax sound. And, so it is what it is. And then he started writing and whoa, look out when he started yeah. doing that. <laughs> so good was him and Hay uh, David Porter, Hayes and Porter. Oh, they wrote some big songs, big ones. Tell us a bit about Soul Man. My connection with Soul Man, it was not my idea. I don't know whose idea it was. And I never did ask. It was, 
either Isaac's idea or David's idea. <clears throat> but the intro thing that I do, and uh, I don't know that slide look I do in the middle came later, came on the right. session. Uh, the intro, Isaac come back to me the day before and he said, Cropper, I know that, that David and I have written a hit and you're the intro guy. We can't come up with an intro for it. <clears throat> Would you just take five minutes out of your day and come down and help me do an intro? And I said, okay, I'll do that. I was in the middle of mixing something. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, he, I, he came, said, I said, well, come down to the piano and I plugged in my guitar and all that. And I said, well, play something. He said, what are you talking about? Play something that goes with the song in the same key. Okay, and that was the intro thing. I said, stop it right, that's it right there. And I started playing those hammer licks along with the changes he was doing. And it seemed to work out. And that was the intro we stuck with. I think the, when Sam said, play it, Steve, was on about the third take. And that was the take. It just happened to be the best take they did, the best performance. And that's the one we went with. Wow. I didn't even think about it when he did it. I, I wasn't thinking about that. I wasn't conscious of it. I didn't bring it up or down any, any more or any less. I just, it was part of the song. So it is what it is. Then Belushi, I think, when we did the Blues Brothers, uh, made it made really more of a statement out of it on stage. Yeah. He, he, he finished, he'd go, Doug Dunn, Steve Cropper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a guitar player, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what can you tell us about Duck? Because I he was just a great personality, uh, uh, a great bass player. You know, uh, in the in the intro of things, I mean, he wanted to be a guitar player like all the other oh, buddies wow. in the originally, but he couldn't get it like the rest of them did. He just couldn't get it. One day he came to rehearsal and had a bass with him. I just bought this bass. I said, well, okay. How's it sound? Well, it sounds pretty good. And he plugged it up and started playing it. Wow, well, that sounds good. We, we were, <laughs> for bass, we would just uh, depend on uh, the low end of the guitar or whatever and comfort right. us. We never thought about the bass itself. And uh, that happened to be one of my first sessions was over at Sun. Scotty Moore had me come in and double the upright bass. And that's when people recording went to the Fender bass. A lot of them played with a pick. Doug never played with a pick. He had real strong fingernails. Right. So he pops a string with, it, with his finger and his fingernail at the same time. Okay. Sounds like he's using a pick, but he's not. And maybe that, that would be something that the fans would get off on. Oh, yeah. But he always played upstrokes, never did play down much. And uh, most of Duck's basses had an imprint where the thumb was resting. Yeah. And he'd just dig a hole in it because he wasn't playing it and he would just, he would just eat out the wood. You know, <laughs> there was always a hole in those basses. <laughs> and the other thing we did, you know, the bass, the Fender bass, <clears throat> they always had that metal cover over it. Yeah. Is a shield over the pickups? We always took that off. It's very easy to take off. On the Telecasters, we just take them off. On the bass, they took them off. <clears throat> a lot of them didn't. A lot of bass players later, they would put foam rubber in, in the strings, yeah. move them down. And Duck and I both muted basically with the butt of our hand. Right, yeah. You know, and, and we just make sure that we were muting the strings we were playing. I don't think my whole hand would go over six strings that wide, but it's close. So if I'm, you know, playing on the low strings, they're muted. Everything is muted pretty much. So that's what we do. That's the sound we have. You know, one, uh, one of my favorite guitar players and you worked with him was Albert King. All right. What was he like to work with? Well, he just had a style like nobody else had. It was it was amazing, but he played uh, left-handed upside down. Right. So instead of bending strings up, he would pull them down. Right. And uh, I'm assuming that when Jimmy finally went all the way left-handed, he would take a guitar, turn it upside down. He play always played left-handed, but he sometimes had the big strings on the top, little yeah. strings on the bottom. And I think then eventually he went with the little strings on top. <laughs> And he pulled down, and that's the way Albert did. And, and I said, Albert, how did you come up with that tuning? He says, well, Copper, he said, that's the way it was tuned. The son tuned it. <laughs> he said the guitar, his uncle had this guitar that sat by the back door, and it was open most of the time during the summer. So the sun would hit, and the strings would go down. His E string was tuned down to a, to a C. Right. He just flopped. It didn't really, I mean, it had a sound, and he would use it as a, hmm, you know, he'd make yeah. a sound out of it. And I know it when he does it. <laughs> but uh, he, he just had a way of playing melody when he played the blues, you know. It was just the way he did it. And he'd usually do it on about three strings. 
Okay. You know, I don't think he got over into the that'd be the fourth string too much over in the D string. I know he never did do that. He just had the oddest tuning of anybody I've ever seen. The thing about his tuning is real simple. If you raise the third a whole step, you get an E minor. A whole, uh, not a whole step, a half step. That would be from uh, whatever it is uh, in the F position, from the E position to the F position. So you would get an E minor. And you know, a lot of blues is a minor blues. So right. it worked for him pretty good. I couldn't do it at straight tune. <laughs> I played a lot of those bass lines and all I did was really double duck. And even though some of the lines were written for us, like Booker wrote the one for Born Under Bad Time. Da, 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 yeah. da, da, da. And uh, the reason we played it in E because you get the low E. Da, 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 da. Right. It's in the C sharp, I think. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Now, when I first started playing, I, I I guess I dabbled in the heavier stuff when I started out. Then I got into your music and in a big way. And one of the things, I, I mean, I picked up everything I could find, but one of the things that I really love, I love it all, but I really love is the album you did with uh, Pops, uh, Pop Staples oh, and together. Albert King. And, I love the song Water. And, and you don't little... give yourself enough credit as a vocalist. <laughs> uh, I don't know. What I do, Water? Yeah. But I've I've been doing it lately live, and I do it slightly different than the original. <laughs> so this time, that song was written in Washington, D.C. It was started in D.C. And I tell that story, too, that... Uh, Eddie shows up to take me to the airport. And I said, Eddie, I've got a great idea for a song. He said, what's that? I said, water. He said, water, you can't write a song about water. Said, Give me my guitar, watch this. And uh, this is a true story. I got the idea earlier before he showed up. I turned, I went to go take a, you know, shower wound up. There's no shower in the, in the Holiday Inn, in those Holiday Inns, of course, in DC. It wasn't in those days. And uh, so there was a tub. So I'm in there sloshing water around. I said, wow, we need to write a song about water. <laughs> That's where it came from. Give me water. Why don't you? <laughs> how, how did that uh, that whole album come together? The Jam Together album? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> well anything was... with an idea comes together, but it was uh, Al Bell's idea. Right to do that, to get the three of us together, the three guitar players at Stax. And it worked out real good. I'm not sure that, I, I know Pops was happy about it. I'm, I'm not real sure that, I'm, I'm sure Albert was happy about it, but I don't think he was ecstatic about it. It's like we were, we, we thought, well, this is pretty good, you know? No, oh, yeah. And uh, I don't know why uh, Al allowed me to sing that water song and we'd already cut it on Eddie Floyd anyway. And uh, I don't think he ever asked me to sing again after that one. <laughs> but it seemed to work out okay. Well, tell us something about working with Wilson Pickett. Right. He was, Just, one, he was a great guy, a great singer, a great entertainer. And uh, I had made the comment <laughs> that he's the only artist who ever had come to sax that gave everybody a tip after the session was over. And I was told that that was somebody else's idea. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, he seemed pretty good. He was just an awesome guy, great singer. And, you know, but but I think he came by his uh, nickname, honestly, the Wicked Picket. He can turn on you. And he oh. did that on a session. We were up in uh, New York doing a session and he he turned and I, I knew I was doing uh, music for the great outdoors, which he sang, Land of a Thousand Dances re remake for the movie. And uh, I said, don't let him get off on you because if he does, you won't be able to turn him around till tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> and I said, he'll get up. <clears throat> Nothing ever happened. And that's what he does, you know. But he can, uh, he can be pretty evil sometimes if he wants to be. I don't know if he's conscious of what he's actually doing, but he could tick some people off if he wanted to. And he's done it a few times. <laughs> so... We, we happened to have uh, in the studio when I was talking about the session in New York, where he kind of turned and um, Don Covey was with us and Don knew him pretty well. So he took him out in the parking lot and talked to him. He came back gentle as a lamb. You know? <laughs> Man, you're getting out there, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't, I don't know how to, I wouldn't know how to handle it. 
being a producer, I still wouldn't know how to handle it. I know how to handle, handle situations, but not individuals. <laughs> uh, how was it working with uh, Lee Von Helm? About as good as it gets. And we were doing something for uh, the Pixies. And uh, they wanted a, an old New Orleans flop beat. And I said, if you want to call some of those guys in New Orleans, they invented it. But if you want the real guy to do the real thing, get Lee Von Helm. And they flew him in. Said, <laughs> One take. That was it. Wow. <laughs> oh, he could do it. He could play that old slot beat. And uh, we wound up, we were with him with the RCO All Stars. We wound up playing the Superdome. Wow. Mardi Gras. And that's where they bring in all of the floats from the parade. Right. Put them in a circle. So we got to see all those floats really up close with all the flowers and all this stuff or something. <laughs> and all that Mardi Gras stuff. And they get up there. Some of them are just trailers and they throw beads out and all that kind of stuff. And uh, most of them are just flatbed trailers being pulled by some kind of cab, or, you know, a regular truck or a big truck or whatever, whatever it takes. But it's, it was a lot of fun. And he played that old old stuff that he used to sing on uh, with the band and all that. And that's, ain't nobody like him. So you want to know about Levon Helm? He was one of the best drummers I ever worked with. Oh, wow. <laughs> Other than Al Jackson. He had a big respect for Al Jackson. So did Anton Fig and a lot of other drummers. Yeah. So. Now, did, uh, I, it seems like I remember uh, Al, did, was, did Al take his, uh, put his wallet on the snare? He did. Now, today they tape them down to deaden them a little bit. Well, today's music, they play a drum like it's bought from the store. It sounds like somebody beating on the bottom of an empty <laughs> coffee can is what it sounds like to me. Yeah. But if that's what they like, that's what they like. And we did everything to change that. So I was saying also in mixing, I said, man, we spent hours and hours getting clicks and pops out of tapes and songs. And that's what they want to hear. They want to hear the needle scratching and popping and up and down and the pops and crackles. And it gets dust in there and the needle will go pop, you know, it'll make this real high pitch sound. They love that. Okay. That's what they like. We spent years trying to get rid of some of that stuff. And some of it required cutting windows in the tape with a real sharp uh, razor blade. Wow. <laughs> We'd do that and it'd go by, have a hole in it. It's just, you wouldn't hear it click anymore. <laughs> you had to be careful not to cut into the music though. You had to know where that click oh, was. Yeah, yeah. They had to be so exacting. <laughs> so one of the biggest hits I think we ever did was Walking the Dog. Oh yeah. And I remember it had, it had somewhere around 17 slices in it. Oh, my God. Slices. Tom Dowd did that. He took a quarter of a beat out ever so many bars. There was 17 in the whole record. So, so there was a bunch of splicing tape going by his record tape. It was really funny when you watch him go across the heads. Wow. <clears throat> but it felt great. <clears throat> he knew what he was doing. Then I think there were some uh, stereo versions that came out. And it didn't have that. I mean, it didn't have the edits in it. So oh, it was, you couldn't tell the difference. I mean, if you knew the song, you didn't pay any attention. Nobody paid any attention. But Al wanted to be, I mean, Al, Tom Dowd wanted to be a little tighter. So we played really loose in those days. So. You can help support this podcast and get some cool merch by visiting tbpcpodcast.com slash shop. Choose from a selection of mugs or one of T-Bone's iconic t-shirts. That website again is tbpcpodcast.com slash shop. Now I'm going to go back to the Blues Brothers a little bit and just if you could talk just a little bit about how that band was assembled. I mean, how, how did you got word that they wanted to get you and everything? <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell as much story as I can. Sure. Uh, Duck called me, Duck Dunn. He said, do you have anything for me to do? And the next day or so, and I said, no, not that I know of. And I was doing something else. So anyway, he said, uh, well, Levon Helm was a good friend of his. He used to see Levon a lot. And when they came through Memphis, the band came through Memphis or whatever, Levon would go out to Duck's house. And I think he actually stayed there one time. But anyway, he said, Levon has asked me to come up to Woodstock and play on an album. I said, well, fine. Have fun, man. It'd be great. 
So he gets up there. He calls me about two, three days later. He said, Leo, I want to know what you're doing. I said, well, nothing. I'm mixing, <clears throat> but I can stop it. He said, well, get up here as soon as you can. We're going to cut the, cut an album. So we went up and did, did an album with Levon Helm. We wound up doing a couple albums. and pretty successful. So Levon books us this gig at the Palladium for New Year's Eve, and we all agreed to do it. The connection between that and the Blues Brothers, we had the Saturday Night Live horns okay. in that band. That is a connection. Belushi was there that night at the Palladium, New Year's Eve. And he said, I was, I was told that he said to somebody, he said, if I ever put a band together, I want that band. So he heard us play live and he said, I want that band. And so when he put together this, when Steve Martin asked him to put something together uh, to open at the Universal Amphitheater, and they were on hiatus anyway that summer. So, uh, Belushi told Steve Martin, he said, well, you know, Danny and I don't do a uh, stand-up comedy. And he said, I know that, but he said, do whatever you want to do. I just want you opening for me. And so they've asked me to come up with something. And so I want you guys to open for me. And so Belushi says, well, can we play music? And Steve Martin said, man, if you want to play music, play music. <laughs> and so that's when John got the idea. I put a band together. <laughs> so he goes to Tom Malone, who was director of the Saturday Night Live band at that time. Mm -hmm. and said to him you know i've got these gigs we got open for steve martin for nine shows at the universal amphitheater out in l.a should we take the whole saturday night live band and tom malone told him at the time and this is what tom told me he said i i told belushi you you need to get done and cropper because they're old road dogs they had we had done two world basically two world tours with them oh yeah <laughs> and uh and we did we knew the road a little bit and uh i don't know where Tom got the idea we knew more than we knew, but he did. He said, <laughs> so that was his suggestion. So Belushi called me and I was mixing, I was doing a Robin Ford at the time. And I had a couple of, I was working on a third to the last one and I had a couple more to mix. And uh, so the girls on the switchboard had the instructions that if I'm mixing, I do not get disturbed. And so I said, unless it's Alan Ryder, who's a friend of mine at the time at the publisher company. And we used to go to lunch all the time and he would call me and say, you know, this is Alan. I need to talk to Steve. Okay. Alan. And he'd always say he was Stevie wonder or the president or somebody like that. <laughs> I always make up some fictitious name. And I knew that's who it was. So the first time Belushi, he said, this is John Belushi. And I hung up. on him. <laughs> <laughs> so that happened a couple of times. And then uh, the second time he's explaining the third time he said, Cropper, don't hang up. Don't hang up. This is really John Belushi. I said, why? <laughs> And he says to me, he says, I understand you and Donald Duck Dunn don't get along very well. <laughs> that was his introduction to me. And he knew better. He knew we've been friends since the sixth grade. So since little kids. And uh, he wanted me to come to New York to rehearse for these shows. I said, John, I can't do it. I'm in the middle of mixing. And so I hung up the third time. And so Robin Ford was in the couch down below the console. And he stands up and he says, who are you talking to? I said, John Belushi wants me to come to New York and rehearse with the band, but I can't do it. I'm mixing your album. He said, I'll do it. I said, no, you won't. <laughs> so I called John back and I said, if you can wait a couple of days, I'll get up there. And uh, he did. And I had already talked to the engineer before I called John back and said, can you mix these and just play them to me over the phone or something? And so I can agree to the mixes or send me copies or whatever. He said, sure. So we did. That's the way we did it. And I forget what songs we're working on, but. That was a good album too. The Robert Ford album was a great album, and he's oh, such yeah. a great player. He's an awesome player. He's better now. He's he's sort of I would put him not in the same venue as uh, as Jeff Beck, but he's that he's got a style like I wow. wouldn't say playing wise not like him, but his attitude is like him. He just gets better with time. With age, he gets better and better and better. And and so it's, Jeff Beck has just got better and better and better. And I don't think he's ever topped the song that we had, the going down. Oh, yeah. to play it, as you well know. I think it's simple. And it was uh, originally uh, an instrumental that we had uh, for Booker T for yeah, Booker T and EMGs. And originally we had a Slim Jenkins joint because that was the name of the bar of the hamburger place we used to go to, the joint we used to go to oh, next to the studio. So I come to work one day and it says Slim Jenkins joint. I went inside, wrote the song. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. <laughs> so when we got ready to put the record out, they said, oh, that's too suggestive. You can't use that. You're going to change it. So we changed it to Slim Jenkins place. <laughs> so that's the record that came out 
Slim Jenkins place. Oh, yeah. So Don Nix, our old baritone player, and he also had the Alabama State Troopers, I think was his big band later mm -hmm. after the Marquis. But he was uh, the baritone player in the Marquis and went to school with Duck and I. And uh, he was producing Freddie King up in Chicago. And uh, he wrote lyrics to Going Down and uh, he wrote to Going Down. That was Slim, to Slim Jenkins' place. He wrote lyrics to us and cut it on uh, on Freddie King. Wow. Going down, 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 down. <laughs> I love it. You produced the album, the uh, the one they called the Orange album, right? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Jeff Peck Group. Jeff Peck Group. Mm -hmm. There was a Max Middleton and Bobby Tennyson. Oh yeah. And uh, Columbia playing drums, and who? Uh, not Bobby Columbia, but uh, Cozy Powell, I think, played drums on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a great record. Uh, Chapman played bass. And <laughs> Bobby Tennyson was a singer on that. I had no idea when I was producing, he was also a great rock guitar player. I had no oh, wow. idea. <clears throat> so through the years he did that and I just knew him as a singer. He never mentioned he played guitar. <laughs> I wouldn't either around Jeff Beck. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of hard for me and I'd sit there and I'd go, well, I know a little bit about guitar. No, you can't get that there. You can't get that sound and play in that position. He did. Whatever was in his head, that's what he played. His wow. hands just I mean, I've heard of playing by ear, but that's just ridiculous. He just could make a make a guitar do whatever he wanted it to do. Whatever's in his head, that's what it, what came out of it. Right. He was yeah. still playing with the pick back then, wasn't he? Yeah, more than than the finger touch stuff. Yeah. And uh, I think on that that album, he used uh, one of my old amps. I think the Gibson Switchmaster. And. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty good amp. We also use that amp on uh, the Tower Power record. Oh. Bump City album. We use that amp. And that's one I brought over to TMI. The other one, uh, the one I started with, the Harvard amp, the Fender Harvard, uh, that was Green Onions and some older stuff and some other things I did. But uh, I, used, I kept that at home. I didn't bring it out too much. And I still had it. It's in Smithsonian right now. And I, oh, I couldn't give him the guitar. I don't know where it is. And I said, you know, I'll give you the next best thing, the amp I played through. And which they enjoyed that quite often. They thought that was pretty cool. Supporting T-Bone Prime Cuts on the Other Side podcast gives you interesting inside views from the talk space where musicians matter. Go to tbpcpodcast.com and click the donate button. All contributions are much appreciated. Just going back to the Blues Brothers a little bit, was <laughs> did you have as much fun as it during the film as it, as it, it seemed? Appeared to be, well, anytime it appears to be fun, you're usually working your butt off. So. Right. Uh, I think we had more fun doing the movie than we did doing the album, but it was a lot of fun because Duck and I were just playing the same stuff we played in high school. <clears throat> I mean, no why. We just played the same old stuff we'd always played. So it was easy for us. It sounds like we're really playing hard, but if we're not, I mean, it's an easy gig. And uh, Lou Marini tells a story about Jack Nicholson was sitting in the front row and he lowers his sunglasses and goes, put <laughs> the back up. <laughs> So Louie tells that story. That's what he remembers. I don't remember him doing that. I remember him being out there. I didn't see that particular moment. He was over by the horn side. So anyway. Now, what a lot of people don't know is, you know, like you were, like you were saying, that was a band bef way, well before the movie. And matter of fact, you even put out an album, you know, Briefcase of Blues or Briefcase whatever. Briefcase of Blues, yeah. Yeah, and it sold like 4 million copies. Yeah. Well, at the time it sold three and then you know, to date it's over four, but uh, yeah. I think the sale of it, Atlantic was allowed, uh, that allowed Atlantic to put a little more pressure on Universal to do a movie. And so when Danny went in with the script and the whole thing, they'd already seen the script and turned it down. They said, we're not gonna make this movie. So they called him back and said, okay. So they said, well, we're gonna have to teach uh, actors how to play instruments. And Danny said, no, we're gonna use the whole band. They said, no, you can't do that, Hollywood. <laughs> Danny said, then you don't get a movie. And he told me later, Danny said, I fought for you guys so hard. He said, I bit my lip when they told me I couldn't do it. He said, blood can <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, I'll take his word for that one. 
but he had already acted out the movie to me and he, he called me he was he was renting a house down on Wrightwood, which is three three minutes from my house he said how soon can you get down here so as soon as i get get to the car and get down here so come on down i got something to show you so i get down there and i go in the living room and he grabs me and sets me in the couch and and grabs a, a footstool an ottoman and stands in the middle of the room and read me and acted out that whole script wow. and i was belly aching just going nuts and uh, i knew it was funny and that after that is when he got the idea to rip the yellow pages off of the uh, la phone book oh yeah he wrapped the yellow pages around the script and threw it over the back fence <laughs> 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 i think of uh it, i think he threw it over the fence to bob weiss he wanted bob to produce it <laughs> he did so that's that is all a true story that actually happened that way one thing that I found interesting was uh, you being on the uh, Jesse Winchester record. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I'd heard that song before. Uh huh. Because I mentioned in there. <laughs> yeah, the Club Manhattan <laughs> song. Come to Nashville, cut a record. He said, We got to call Cropper to come up and play on this yeah. thing. And I went over there with He was there, and all that was pretty good. And we played on it and had a, had a blast. It was just a fun time for everybody. <laughs> um. So I. No, I, I take that stuff with a grain of salt. I don't. I don't think with songs written about me. I don't think about it. Is anybody special? I just go. Yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> well, uh, what's this? Uh, the tour with Dave Mason like? Well, uh, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, musically, it was great. I, I had no idea I've known Dave for forty some odd years, but I never really played with him. And I'm not a big record collector, so I didn't know yeah. what he played on all that sort of stuff. I didn't realize until I went out with him what a great player he is. Oh, he yeah. is a, a mama jama player. He's a great player, a great guitar player. So it was fun. And, uh, you know, there was no competition. That was a good thing. I just did my thing and he did his thing, you know, which is good. And one of the funny moments that the, that the audience got off on when he said, well, I wrote this, so I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> they thought that was great. So, you know, he said, well, I know when we did it, it was a, it came out as a traffic record, but I wrote it. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> he, he didn't change it that much. It still sounded like the same song. <clears throat> I, I really... Uh... I know I'm jumping all over the place here, but I really love your playing on, on some of the Rod Stewart stuff. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was a lot of fun. I, that was, uh, I was inspired by two, two people that time, Rod Stewart for one for definite and Tom Dow the other one. He was such oh, yeah. a good guy to work with. And I'd worked with him before he worked with us with the uh, Booker T and MGs and also with Otis Redding when we played. And, and uh, he was very integral part of Sax Records. He helped wire the uh, stereo machine into the board, the existing board, before Welter Zaton got a hold of it and gave us a new new console. <laughs> <laughs> it was a much better. I thought it was a better sound, and so did our engineers and all that. They thought things were much better than the old archaic way we used to do stuff. We had two Ampex mixers, four each, with the eighth pot being the return for the echo. And I think there's some stereo records that when it first came out, the echo was all on one side. <laughs> there was no center, there was no middle. Right. You had no way of panning stuff. And there's a guy that's doing a, a book on studios and recording. And he said, how did you guys send the signals to the echo chamber? And I said, you know, I don't know. And I thought maybe Jim Stewart would remember. We hooked him up with Jim, Jim didn't remember either. Remember if you turn the volume up, Oh, on the eighth pot, you got echo. <laughs> That's all he knew. <laughs> he don't know how it got out to the back. It was, it was a bathroom originally. Had the okay. old uh, black and white little hex tiles in it. Oh, yeah. The bathrooms. And, uh, it, you know, you clap your hands and it ring for 10 minutes. It seemed like. So it had a, a real nice decay on a perfect echo chamber. And that's what we use. And, and I remember a mic hanging in the ceiling and a speaker on the floor. <laughs> But what was coming through that, I mean, I knew what was coming through the, the mic or the, what the mic was picking up, but I didn't know how the signal was getting through the speaker on the bottom floor. Never wow. even thought about it. I wasn't an engineer in those days. Yeah. But I didn't do that by then. I learned on, by, by and I really wasn't ever an engineer. I just knew how to mix things. Tommy Dowd taught me how to read a v, VU meter. Um, one one uh, 
artists that we have in common, because I was actually in the studio and got to see you play, was John Oates. And right. I remember you said, what do you, want, what do you want me to play here? He said, just play some Steve Proper. And that, <laughs> it, what the heck is Steve? I get that. Just be yourself. Okay. <laughs> you may not like it, but I can do it. <laughs> it is what it is, but that's that was pretty cool. John's a great guy, too. <laughs> Daryl Hall, man. What a singer. Oh, yeah. I, I never really got to meet him. I talked to him a few times, but I, I, right. got, but I was around John a lot. Um, now, see, I mean, people that know you know know a lot of this stuff, but people will be surprised to see, like, you know, playing on a couple of Beatles records. You played on <laughs> Ringo Star stuff and John Lennon. I mean, and, and I remember reading uh, that when the, when they came to meet you, when they when they first met you, that they what did they bow to you or something? Yeah, I don't know why they did it, but they did. It was like. <laughs> Their idea of reverence, I guess, or something. And oh, yeah. So I never knew until way later. They said, you know, the Beatles really did listen to a lot of Stax records. I said, really? They were listening to Motown, too. <laughs> and uh, what was uh, one of their first records that Paul was singing on? Uh, they did some Carl Perkins songs and some oh, songs. Yeah. And, you know, when they, they really started early on things that were hits in the 50s, they were out in the 60s and, and still bringing them around. And that's pretty cool, I thought. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of the songs didn't really hit nationally. They hit yeah. their local areas and around. Right. And so the Beatles put them on the map, I thought. So that's pretty cool. Well, I was I was just going to ask you, because he died you know, fairly recently, it was John Prine. You are producing him. How was that? Well, John was just a super guy, and we stayed friends through the years. And I remember in, a, in an interview one time, they asked John, they said, man, it's a pretty good record. When are you going to make another record in Memphis? He said, never. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he stuck to that. By, by doing that, he made it a classic, I think. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. The Common Sense record. And uh, he had already had Hello in there and all that on, on a previous album. And all. I mean, when they said... We want you to produce John Prine. I want to, you do? Why? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, he knew and I knew that was not my style, but I knew good songs. And uh, he brought in uh, Hootie Fly and Steve Goodman. Oh, yeah. He wrote some of that stuff and played on it. He gets off the plane. I go out to the airport to pick him up. He gets off the plane with an acoustic guitar in hand playing Green Under Down and <laughs> playing the <bass. laughs> You are crazy. <laughs> so anyway, we became pretty good friends before he passed away. So, uh, you know, I did uh, a couple of sessions in John's studio with him not there. And where we would meet would be uh, on a plane or at the airport or somewhere. He'd be leaving, going somewhere, and I'd be leaving, going somewhere else. And that's, that's where we'd cross paths. Right. So a lot of that was going on at the airports. <laughs> This is a this is a tough question and one that you may not be able to answer, but I thought it'd be interesting to ask you what I don't even think you can probably quantify this, but what do you think are the top three highlights of your career? Or or just some of the highlights. They don't have to be the top ones, but I have no idea. Uh, I can name three artists off the bat. Oh yeah. That'd be head. fine. One would be Booker T, the best instrumental player, musician I have ever worked with. Two of the best singers, Otis Redding and Rod Stewart. A lot of great singers, a lot of great players. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I did say but, and I didn't really mean it that way. It, it sounds a little negative, but uh, so many great players I've been fortunate enough to work with, including the Beatles. Like you said, you brought them up. And I was going to say about the Beatles, if we had continued, that Paul is the only one I never actually went to the studio with, but I was in the studio with him when he was mixing uh, something at Hyder when he was out with the, the Wings. Oh, okay. With Lyndon and Wings. Yeah, I think it was uh, Listen to What the Man Says, or one of those. Oh, yeah. Band on the run, that one. The one that has the uh, thing that goes into strings in the middle and all that sort of stuff. Oh, right. I don't, I don't even remember what I was working on. I was mixing something over Wally Hyder. Could have been Rod. 
I don't, I don't remember what it was. And they said, you know, Paul is next door mixing a record and he wants you to come over and say hello to him when you get a chance. So, okay. so I did that. Super guy. <laughs> and I had met him a couple of times. That's the reason he, he, he did. It wasn't just out of the blue. I mean, I had met him uh, at a, uh, at a party and, um, Matter of fact, he, he he invited me to. I went to the party because I got an invite. It was his party, the Paul McCartney party, and he had Michael Jackson there and everybody in the world at that party. And then I was invited to another one, the Venus to Mars party, that he did, and uh, that was pretty good. He had the Meters as a back, as a band playing the music and all the stuff, and Carl Malden was there, people like that, and oh, oh. it's just <laughs> cable, cable stars. You walk in there, you just with your jaw. <laughs> Get up until you get in the car and get home. And go, I can't believe what I just did. And the people I just met is mind boggling. Right. It really is. And uh, you said, what's the biggest? That'd be it, I think, is just being around artists and all is the highlight of anything. And I've been lucky enough to I get to do it. I, get to, I was doing it every day for about nine or 10 years. <laughs> and then I get to meet somebody like Belushi and and Levon Helm, which we talked about a little bit about Levon. And so, uh, you know, when I left Saks, I told them, I said, I'm not going across the street and go in competition. And I didn't. So I produced a lot of pop acts. I think the first one was a band called Dreams. And then I got to produce, uh, you know, Tower Power and uh, with uh, Ronnie Capone and and uh, Jeff Beck and people like that. And we just had a, had a, just made fun out of life is what it was. Right. Out of making records and duck used to say that when he'd sit down we're not gonna make uh, work out of this are we boys that kind of a thing <laughs> he said well in other words i'm leaving i'm un- i'm not even gonna plug up unless we're gonna have a good time <laughs> he wasn't talking about booze and drugs he was just talking about having a good time with music man there was no drugs in those days i mean we just didn't even think about that in the 60s we didn't do drugs you know we might drink on a gig at night, but we recorded from uh, about 10, 10, 1030 in the morning until about 435 in the afternoon, mm. you know, so we <laughs> ate a lot of bread and drank a lot of chocolate milk. Cause I like to, and uh, then I found out later in life, many years later, that there's no nourishment in a Twinkie. <laughs> <laughs> go to the grocery store next door and get a thing of Twinkies and some chocolate milk and sit there next to my amp and drink that. And heat those twinkies, no nourishment whatsoever. So I don't remember malnutrition ever setting in. <laughs> <laughs> now, do, do you enjoy the fact that, uh, I mean, as big a star as you are, that like I went, I ate with you one time and nobody seemed to know who you were. And I mean, <laughs> I mean you could go. Thing. Yeah, I was going to say, you can go under the radar a lot. You know, you can walk around and people, you know, sometimes someone will recognize you, I'm sure, but, you know, I, not as much as they should. But, to, what you know, is it, you enjoy that? Yeah, I do. I enjoy people not knowing who I am. Right. I do enjoy that. And uh, that was kind of hard to do for a while after the Blues Brothers. And I did the uh, Tom Snyder show one time. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> then I went to the NAMM show in L.A., and I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I was well known for about three weeks and then it died off. You know? <laughs> so it's just a moment of enjoyment, I guess. I mean, it's fun to be recognized. It's also fun to not be recognized. <laughs> I love it when somebody thinks you're somebody else. That's, that's great. <laughs> Why do you think the songs that you recorded in the 60s still work today? <laughs> well, I think it's the only thing that is out there that people can actually dance to. That makes you it makes you want to dance with you. You realize you listen to it. It's it's kind of lame and dumb and whatever by today's standards. But it'll make you rock a little bit. And I say, you know, when we're in a concert, if if you got theater seats, I said, I know you can't get up and dance, but if you just shake your booty, you're gonna have a better time. <laughs> So I think that was it. And the other thing uh, I get asked a lot, why do you think those songs were such hits? Because they were instrumentals. You take the vocal away, you're going to lose the vocal, but you're still going to get the song. Yeah. It's going to groove. And that's what, that's what Al Jackson, we were all about was about dance music. And uh, I mentioned this earlier about Albert King. 
we'd take old blues songs and put a beat to them so people could dance to them. And that's that made them more popular than you, you could think. It was great. And it was a good formula to do. The thing that was, it was uh, lucky for us that we had a guy like Al Jackson. When we would go to Detroit or Chicago or anywhere to do a show with Booker T and EMGs, Al would be watching the dancers and he would know what they danced to. He would know what song to call next. And he would see how many people were on the floor. He'd keep them on a dance floor all night long doing that. So the next day we're in the studio, usually on a Monday when we did instrumentals and all, he would start with a groove, even if we had a vocalist. He'd start with a groove of what he saw those people, kids dancing to over the weekend. <laughs> and he was very good at that. He would remember that, the tempo and all that. He didn't need electronic drums to do that. <laughs> and uh, we'll close out with this one. I think this is pretty funny. I got a call one time from one of the uh, uh, manufacturers or drum magazines that said, we understand that Stax was the first studio to use uh, uh, mechanical drums like Lynn drums or whatever. And I said, yeah, his name was Al Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I really want to thank you for this because talk to you was great and seeing you again for the first time and like 10 years was great too. It's been, been a while and uh, we love what you did. All right. Well, thank you for this. I'll, uh, I'll anytime. All thank right. You. Well, thank okay. you. Thanks, I'll talk Mary. to you. Appreciate it. You Bye. bet. I'd like to thank Steve Cropper for all his time today. And be sure to go to playitsteve.com to buy his new record or pick it up anywhere great music is sold starting April 23rd. And be sure to go to tbpcpodcast.com and click that donate button. We'll see you next time.